Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mind, where we talk about mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. My name is Vic Shy, and in this video, I'll be covering the latest entry in the American Grudge series, The Grudge 2020. The newest entry in the Grudge franchise takes place from 2004 to 2006, before and during the events of the original three films. The film serves as an untold chapter in the franchise, told through the perspective of a police detective investigating a whole new curse. Unlike The Grudge 3 before it, this film returns to the series' roots of storytelling, as the events are told across different moments in time and non linear order. This film received some negative reviews from both fans and critics. I can definitely see where they were coming from, but I can attribute the negative reception to the nearly 25 minutes of deleted scenes that were criminally cut from the final product. While these scenes certainly don't turn the grudge into a perfect film, they definitely help enhance the narrative and character development. I'll be going over the events that take place throughout the film, explaining the ending and exploring the deleted scenes that were cut from the film. Losing your life to a seemingly unstoppable curse is terrifying, but so is losing your wallet. Thankfully, our video sponsor, Exter, has just the solution. Exter has a variety of wallets that not only look great, but offer convenient functionality, like the Parliament for example, a premium leather wallet that offers slim, low-profile storage that also gives you quick access to your cards at the simple click of a button. Insert Exter's smart card tracker that connects straight to your phone and never lose track of your wallet again. This is a great and convenient feature, especially for someone like me who often misplaces his wallet. With the holidays right around the corner, treat yourself and your loved ones to some truly quality products by clicking the link in the description down below and receive 30% off all orders. Thank you again to Exter for sponsoring this video. But without further ado, sit back and relax and join me as we explore the new deadly curse in The Grudge 2020. Our movie begins in Tokyo, Japan, right before the events of the first film in 2004. We see a woman named Fiona Landers leaving the cursed Saeki house, and is speaking to a woman named Yoko on the phone. Fiona is a social worker who works for the Narima Care Center and was taking care of a woman named Emma Williams, who suffers from dementia. Emma is the mother of Matthew Williams, an American businessman who recently moved into the home with his wife Jennifer. For those unfamiliar with the series, the house originally belonged belonged to the Saeki family. In 2001, husband Takeo Saeki discovered his wife Kayako's journal, which revealed her love and obsession for a man named Peter Kirk. Enraged by the revelation, Takeo brutally murdered Kayako by snapping her neck and stabbing her multiple times with a box cutter. He then drowned their seven-year-old son Toshio along with their cat. This gave birth to the curse known as Juon. Kayako Saeki returned in the form of an Onryo, known in Japanese folklore as a vengeful spirit seeking revenge for the wrongs they endured during their lifetime. Kayako returned and hung Takeo with her long black hair, making him the first victim of the very curse he created. The curse manifested inside of the house and anyone who enters it is doomed to die a horrible death. The curse works in different and mysterious ways. Some are killed as soon as they encounter the curse. Others are stalked by the spirits of Kayako and Toshio for an unspecific amount of time until they are eventually killed. The curse can even attach itself to an individual who then acts as a carrier for the curse. Unlike in the Japanese Juan series, only those who step inside of a cursed location become cursed. In the Juan series, someone can become cursed simply by coming into contact with an already cursed individual, acting like a virus that spreads from person to person. The curse has also been known to possess people and force them to commit a violent act of murder, thereby giving birth to a whole new curse and cursing the very location where the deaths occurred. As confusing and convoluted as this all sounds, the curse itself is the embodiment of revenge. It will not stop and will consume anyone it comes into contact with. But when will it end? Fiona likely encountered the spirits of Kayako and Toshio inside the house and wants to return to America. She is calling Yoko to replace her and says she will leave the keys with Alex at the care center. We can see the curtains moving from inside the house, which is possibly Kayako watching her. She loses connection with Yoko and briefly encounters Kayako. 
This is a reference to when Takeo Sayeki encountered his wife's spirit in Juon the Curse. After Fiona leaves the house, Yoko arrives the same day and is killed by Kayako. Karen Davis is then sent as a replacement by Alex and the rest is history. Fiona returns to her home in Cross River, Pennsylvania to her husband Sam and daughter Melinda. During the opening credits, we are told that when someone dies in the grip of a powerful rage, a curse is born. Sounds familiar. It gathers in the place of death but cannot be contained. Once you encounter it, it will never let you go. Let it go, let it go. Now in 2006, we meet our main character, Detective Muldoon. Her husband passed away three months ago from cancer, leaving her alone with their son, Burke. She has relocated to the small town of Cross River. On his first day of school, Burke tells her that he is scared. She says that when they're scared, they close their eyes and count to five. But look! There's Mr. Potato Head to give us endless nightmares again. We meet Muldoon's new partner, Detective Goodman, a veteran of the department. They head to the scene where a woman named Lorna Moody was found dead in her car seemingly for months. The officer says she had directions to the address 44 Rayburn Drive in the glove box. 44 Rayburn Drive. Same place as the Landers case. Goodman says he worked a case at that address two years ago that really stuck with him, but doesn't give Muldoon the specifics. So she does what any person would do in 2006, do a Google search on the address using the Mozilla Firefox web browser. She finds an article revealing that the Landers family was murdered inside their home at 44 Rayburn Drive in 2004. The house number 44 is a reference to 10 Fours, a short film that along with Karasumi are the true prequels to the entire Juon series, according to Takashi Shimizu. The article is referring to Fiona Landers and her family. Fiona was cursed the moment she stepped foot inside of the Saeki house, which consumed her and her family as a result. Detective Muldoon goes to 44 Rayburn Drive and meets a crazed woman named Faith Matheson, portrayed by legendary horror actress Lynn Shay. She seems totally out of it, and the fingers on her left hand have been chopped off. Muldoon then discovers the dead and decomposed body of Faith's husband, William Matheson. <laughs> If we take a look at the house, we see that it is very unkept. Like the Sayeki house before it, we know that this is a sign that the curse has taken a hold of a specific location. She speaks with Detective Goodman who reveals that Fiona Landers was the one who murdered her daughter Melinda, her husband Sam, then took her own life. Just like when Takeo Sayeki murdered Kayako and Toshio, this created a whole new curse that has taken a hold of the Landers house. This is very similar to when a possessed Trish Campbell murdered her husband Bill inside of their their apartment, giving birth to yet another curse as seen in The Grudge 2. Goodman has managed to avoid the curse as he never actually stepped foot inside of the house. Smart man. Just didn't feel right. The same can't be said for Detective Muldoon, who is now cursed and being haunted by the ghosts of the Landers family. Goodman and Muldoon's partnership give this movie some much-needed heart, which isn't always present in grudge movies. A deleted scene gives us a more wholesome interaction between the two, which would have been a good idea to keep in. Back in 2004, we meet married couple Peter and Nina Spencer. The Spencers are told by their doctor that their unborn child has a high chance of being born with the genetic disorder ALD. The Landers resident is up for sale and the Spencers are the real estate agents for the house. Peter goes into the residence to get a signature from the Landers who aren't home right now and are probably attending the Vengeful Ghost Academy. He didn't get the signature like he wanted but at least he got a curse. Wait, what? The Spencer storyline is very tragic and I believe they should have been the focus of the film as opposed to Detective Muldoon. I feel their story and situation was much more relatable and made me feel for their characters a lot more. Are you mad at me? No. While taking a shower, a ghostly hand briefly pokes out through Peter's hair. This is the same thing that happened to Karen in The Grudge and Rika in Jew on The Grudge. Watching people take showers must be in the vengeful ghost job description. Peter returns to the Landers house the next day and comes across Melinda, whom at this point is already dead. This is a nod to when Kobayashi came across Toshio alone in the Saeki house in Jew on The Curse. Back in 2006, Muldoon is trying to piece together the connections of all the dead 
deaths related to the Landers house. While in the bathroom, her head is briefly forced underwater by Fiona Landers. The film then cuts to 2005 and tells the story of Faith and William Matheson, an elderly married couple who recently moved into 44 Rayburn Drive. We are told by William that Faith suffers from dementia and that her condition has only gotten worse ever since moving into the house. There is a deleted scene that shows a touching conversation between Faith and William, reminiscing a sweet memory that they had together. That's how I want to remember things. And that's how I want to remember you. Faith decides she wants to end her life on her own terms, so they hire an exit guide named Lorna Moody. This is a practice known as assisted suicide, which Lorna says she has been a part of 44. Lorna Moody is the dead body that was discovered decomposed inside of her car in 2006. The police officer on scene says, uh, The feds, they're already looking for her. This shows that Lorna has been doing this illegally. There is an entire monologue from William and yet another deleted scene, where he says that Faith has attempted suicide three times via overdose. In her last attempt, she was out for four days before waking up again. As seen in 2004's The Grudge, Emma Williams, who also suffered from dementia, was tormented by Kayako for quite some time before being killed. It is possible that Faith has also been tormented by the ghosts of the Landers, which helped push her to commit suicide. Lorna says that she can only help Faith if she is of sound mind to carry out the suicide herself. This is clearly not the case when she goes to speak with Faith who starts playing peekaboo seemingly on her own. This is a reference to Mr. Saito from Juan the Grudge, who was playing peekaboo with the ghost of Toshio. We see that Faith is actually playing with and speaking to the ghost of Melinda. Faith is clearly no longer of sound mind and cannot undergo the assisted suicide. However, Lorna says she still wants to stick around for a couple of days and provide emotional support, aka she just wants a free place to hide from the FBI. That night, Lorna sees a man standing in front of the house in the rain. William tells Lorna that this is Detective Wilson, Goodman's partner who has been working on the Landers case. A case? I hope it wasn't a murder. Double murder suicide with a hint of a Japanese curse to be exact. Detective Wilson has become obsessed with the case and is also cursed. Goodman comes to pick him up and Wilson shoots himself in the face with a revolver. In 2006, Detective Muldoon learns that Wilson has been admitted to a psychiatric hospital. She meets with Wilson whose face is severely scarred from his self-inflicted gunshot wound. He seems fully aware of the curse and says that it will never let her go. He says that he has tapes on the case and that she needs to burn down the house. As she exits the hospital, Wilson is rushed away by the staff for having gouged his own eyes out. He says that he can still feel them watching him, referring to the ghosts of the Landers. Wilson is a rare case in the series as someone who has been cursed for years but has not yet been killed. Wilson was cursed when he began investigating the murders in 2004. Rather than being killed, it seems that he has been tormented by the ghosts of the Landers for the past two years. She listens to Wilson's voice recordings that have a couple couple of cool references to previous films. While investigating the Landers case, he learned about the Saeki murder case that occurred in 2001, which started the original curse. Wilson then spoke to Detective Nakagawa from the 2004 Grudge film. He thinks a murder in that house caused something called a Juan. This is the second time in the American Grudge films that Juan is mentioned, the first time being when Naoko, Kayako's sister, talks about Juan in The Grudge 3. When my sister was killed, a John was born. Wilson believes that Fiona brought the curse back with her from Japan, which made her kill her family. Wilson's character is very similar to that of Jake Kimball from The Grudge 2 and 3. Both Wilson and Jake seem to have more knowledge on the curse than everyone else. Both were tormented by the curse and admitted into a psychiatric hospital. This film actually has a lot of clever similarities and callbacks to both the Japanese and American films of the franchise that I really enjoyed as a fan. At the police station, Detective Muldoon is is creepily being stalked by the spirit of Sam Landers. She tries to tell another detective what she saw, but comes off like she is losing her mind, just like Wilson did. Back in 2004, Peter Spencer is still inside of the Landers house with Melinda, waiting for her parents to come home. He gets a call from his wife Nina, who tells him that she is going to love their baby no matter what. I'm just really, really happy. <laughs> 
This is a very touching yet tragic scene because of the events that follow. Fiona's ghost can be seen through the door viewer and disappears when Peter opens the door, a nod to Katsuya Kotunaga's scene from Juan the Grudge. Fiona Landers can also be seen creeping behind the window. Peter comes back into the house and Melinda is no longer there. As he searches for her, we can make out the sound of Melinda being drowned in the bathtub. Like the real estate agent who sold the Sayeki house in the grudge, Peter finds the bathtub filled with black water. He attempts to run out of the house but is confronted by the spirit of Fiona. In a much more effective deleted scene, Peter finds Melinda in her bedroom doing the typical horror movie kid thing. She is drawing some creepy things which we'll come back to later. He is then lured into the attic and discovers the dead and decaying bodies of Fiona and Melinda. In a truly tragic turn of events, a possessed Peter returns home and murders his wife Nina. The next day, her dead body is seen lying in a pool of blood and Peter has drowned in the bathtub. Due to the sheer amount of blood and how Nina is facing down on her stomach, it is heavily implied that Peter cut out his own unborn child. This would be a direct reference to what Takeo Seiki did when he killed the wife of Shunsuke Kobayashi. Also, we don't know whether Peter killed himself or if he was drowned by Fiona Landers. Based on the rules established by the American Grudge films, the murder of Nina and her unborn child by a possessed Peter has possibly created a whole new curse. This reinforces my belief that the film should have focused on the Spencers as the main story. Their storyline was much more emotionally engaging than Muldoon's, which made their tragic and brutal demise so much more impactful. In 2005, Lorna Moody discovers the house is haunted when she sees the ghost of Fiona Landers hovering over Faith Matheson. Mrs. Matheson. This is just like when Kayako hovers over Grandma Sachi and Emma Williams. William reveals that he has seen the ghost of Fiona and knows that the house isn't normal. Williams's monologue about the house is a beautiful and truly unique perspective on what we know to be a terrifying and deadly curse. He says that in this house, the walls between the dead and the living are torn down. Those who have entered the house and those who will enter are bound together. He sees this as a blessing and a way to stay connected with Faith when she moves on. That is so sweet. I really hope Faith knows just how much William loves her, and she just killed him. Lorna sees Williams' dead body on the floor and that Faith has cut off her own fingers. She runs out of the house screaming and drives off like she's auditioning for the next Fast and Furious movie. More like distraught and dead as the ghost of Sam Landers suddenly pops out from behind her and causes her to crash into the woods. Back in 2006, Muldoon finds that the Lorna Moody and Matheson cases have been turned over to the FBI and that Goodman wants nothing to do with it. Faith is now in the hospital and kills herself by jumping to her death. We see that she was still being tormented by the ghost of Melinda up to her death. One night, Detective Muldoon is lured out of her bed by a shadow in front of her bedroom door. The TV then turns on on its own and someone on the TV says, They say that the dead only want one thing, to go into the light. This was not only a reference to Melinda Landers, but to everyone who fell victim to the curse. Having all been victims of the curse, their spirits were unable to move on. This possibly hints that the only way to end the curse would be to help these vengeful spirits move on, though this is only my speculation. She walks around checking her house with her firearm and thinks she is losing her mind. She has started smoking again, although she told Goodman she quit. She possibly quit smoking after her husband got cancer, which was a nice little character detail. Thinking Sam Landers is in her home, she goes to check on Burke. She calls Goodman in the middle of the night at 4.44 to be exact. She tells him that what happened to Wilson is now happening to her. She decides to end the curse once and for all by burning down the Landers house. She brings her son Burke along instead of just having Goodman watch him for some reason, aka it's a plot device. As she is dousing the house with gasoline, she sees Fiona Landers who says, I want to show you something. 
She is then shown the events that created the whole new curse. We see that a possessed Fiona Landers drowned Melinda in the bathtub, similar to how Takeo Saeki drowned his son Toshio. Sam Landers comes home and sees the gruesome sight of his dead daughter, which leads to a physical struggle between the two. Fiona brutally bludgeons Sam, which causes him to fall down the stairs to his death. The deleted scene shows us that Peter Spencer came to the house for signatures immediately after Sam's death. She tells him to come back the next day, which he ends up doing, and by that point, the curse has already been born. Fiona saws off all of Sam's limbs and places them into a plastic bag that she throws into the river. The body is then discovered by the police and Detective Goodman identifies Sam's body. That's Sam Lunders. These events were depicted in Melinda's drawings from the deleted scenes with Peter Spencer. Fiona then stabs herself in the neck with a pair of scissors. This, along with Sam's fall from the stairs, possibly damaged both of their windpipes before their deaths. This is why both of their ghosts make the iconic grudge death croak. Though there is no explanation as to why Melinda also does this. I guess that's what they teach everyone at the Onryo Academy nowadays. Muldoon isn't phased by what she sees and continues pouring gasoline. Burke suddenly enters the house even though he was told to stay in the car. She can tell something is off about her son as she asks him what they do when we're scared, but he doesn't reply. She lights the house on fire, which reveals Melinda was pretending to be Burke. She successfully sets the house ablaze as she embraces the real Burke who stayed in the car like he was supposed to. You go, pal. Sometime later, Muldoon embraces Burke before he goes off to school. However, in the film's final scene, we get one last act of bamboozlery. I'm going to school, Mom. The Burke she is hugging turns out to be Melinda, and Muldoon is dragged away by Fiona Landers as the movie ends. This shows that Muldoon was unsuccessful in ending the curse. Even though she burned the house, the curse was still attached to her. Aubrey from The Grudge 2 was told by Kayako's mother herself that burning down the house would have no effect. It was even said that setting fire to the Saeki house made the curse grow stronger. Although we don't know the true consequences of having burned down the Landers house, it is clear that the curse is far from over. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was The Grudge 2020. My friends, I hope that you enjoyed seeing all the connections to the previous films as well as filling in the gaps with the deleted scenes. I feel that The Grudge would have been more well received if those scenes had been kept in. While this film doesn't offer anything totally original, it felt like it was made by a true fan of the Juon and Grudge series in Nicholas Pesh. Although, as a fan of the original films, it would have been nice to see something new and original, as opposed to things we've already seen rehashed for a new audience. The film would have heavily benefited from focusing on the Spencer storyline instead of Detective Muldoon. I felt their storyline was much more emotionally engaging, and their tragic end left the door open for a whole new curse being born. Detective Muldoon's ending felt a little cheap, and her story would have served better as a side plot. Also, I never found the ghosts of the Landers family as scary or memorable as the Saekis. They were pretty much a discount version of the Saeki family that relied way too heavily on jump scares. Kayako and Toshio were what made the Juwan and Grudge series so terrifying in the first place. Having them completely replaced with someone new was a huge risk that ultimately didn't pay off. But as always, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Thank you all for tuning in and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.